I am a year out from the military. I was medically retired last year. They medically retired me because I no longer functioned for the Air Force. I've been diagnosed with piriformis syndrome. I've got complex regional pain syndrome where the nerves constantly misfire and it affects my entire leg, hip. It's moved up my back and up my torso. It's called the suicide disease because um, so many people can't live with the pain anymore. I've been in the healthcare field for over 30 years. I'm a registered nurse. Currently, I work as a national healthcare consultant. The mother in me is trying to pick her up and keep her going. It's hard. I started playing softball when I was nine. Oh man, I was competitive. And then I ventured out into horse riding. I absolutely loved it. And uh, I used to love running, just to run. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but it was a huge stress reliever for me. It was nothing for me to run six to eight miles a day. And uh, can't really do those right now. I utilize a cane 99% of the time, especially if I'm walking distance. Probably for the past, I would say eight months or so, I've been at a pain level of eight or greater. It's extremely hard to do basic things being at that level of pain. Um, I don't want to leave the house. I've got yard work that I've got to do and I can't do it for more than two minutes. And then once I do that, I'm out for three days. You know, being 30 years old, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be like this. I should be living my life still, but I'm not. Doctors have told me that the outlook is grim. That it's only going to get worse. That it's it'll continue to um, be debilitating. I could ac actually lose complete function of my leg. I think the hardest thing through this whole journey is to see things that she can't do as this has played out over the years and you're sitting back as a mother and you see your own child kind of almost spinning down the drain and the nurse in me and the mother in me can't fix it. Post 9-11 I decided to join the Air Force. I really wanted to travel and spread my wings. I knew that Joining at 17, I could retire at 37, still young enough to get you know, another job and work another 20 years. I wanted to be able to make a difference. When I was in high school, I took police science and I absolutely loved it. But I knew when I was graduating high school, I was gonna be 17 and I couldn't be a cop anymore until I turned 21. I went to basic training September 2nd and I was still 17. Yeah, Mallory's always had, I guess, a personal sense of service. Always had goals, always had a sense of direction, but there was such a sense of pride, too. You know, it was post 9-11. The kids that were going in the military knew that if they go in the military, there was a good chance that they were going immediately overseas. And that's exactly what happened. I got to my first duty station, Mountain Home, Idaho, in January. And three weeks later, I was on my very first deployment to Camp Doha, Kuwait. June of 2004 is when I was pushed off the road by a semi-truck driving to a traffic control point in Kuwait. And that was the day that changed my life forever. It rolled three and a half times. The driver's side door opened and my right leg went out and under while the rest of my body was still in the vehicle. And then we get the call and said that she was involved in a very, very serious accident. He told me that she was pinned for approximately four hours and they had to extricate her with the jaws of life. When I got to the hospital, they were x-raying everything, told me I had severe bone bruising, but I kept telling them that 
something's wrong with my hip, it, it hurts. And they x-rayed it and they're like, no, nothing, nothing's wrong, you're fine. And um, that ended up not being the case. She came home and there was a big difference. It wasn't the same little girl that left. And I don't think anything can prepare you for that. She had gotten hardened a little bit. I knew that she had been through traumatic things. And then we found out she was going back to the desert again. My second deployment was Camp Buka, Iraq. I had all the weapons qualifications and driving qualifications as all the men I was with. So I was the first female on convoys under my leadership. That non-commissioned officer in charge, he asked me if I could bring anyone to convoys, um, who would it be that I knew that would do a good job? I told him, Elizabeth Jacobson. She's awesome, you know, she knows her stuff. The morning of September 28th, I had the morning run, came back, and as we were coming back, I still felt odd, like something definitely wasn't right, and uh, made it back to Camp Buka. Liz was there, so we were just laughing and joking and um, talking, and, and I told Liz, I'll, I'll see you when you get back, and that was the last thing I ever got to say to her. I was laying in my bed, and I heard an explosion. I knew something, something happened. I lived with that day, and I, uh, every day. She didn't elaborate at the time when we got the call, but she said Liz got killed. And I didn't know the full um, impact or what had happened. When she came home that time, again 30 days, and she came home to us. I knew there was a lot of drinking going on when she came back. And I started seeing coping mechanisms that started to scare me. Um, not as much of a smile, very matter of fact, and then the night terrors. When I returned from that deployment, I couldn't sleep. I was suffering from terrible nightmares, and I was drinking uh, excessively, to say the least. I didn't know at that point I had PTSD. Um, I, thought I, I thought it was a normal reaction, and it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't. If I knew now, you know, I would have I would have gone to mental health earlier but at the same time going to mental health and the career field that I was in carrying a gun every day if you go to mental health they take away your gun if they take away your gun you're useless and uh, I was never gonna be useless throughout those deployments overseas she continued to complain of a lot of pain and discomfort I've Finally broke down and again and went to the hospital. I figured it's a new base, there's new doctors, maybe, maybe they have the answers for me. In 2013, they finally did an MRI with contrast and it showed a torn labrum in my right hip. And they were like, okay, let's do surgery. I wasn't improving. I was having more back problems. So I went to pain management and he did loads and loads of cortisone injections. I was on morphine, uh, I was on Vicodin, I was on Percocet, Valium, <laughs> um, muscle relaxers, and uh, nothing was helping. And I was getting more swelling. And uh, then they started my med board and I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed. That's when the Air Force gave up on me. 11 years, seven months and 28 days from 17 to 29, I grew up in the Air Force. I watched myself grow up and mature and that was all I knew. And when they were taking that away from me, uh, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely devastating. 
It hurts to know that, you know, I lived the Air Force core values. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all you do. And there's a line at the end of the Air Force Creed that says, I will never leave an airman behind. And I really feel like I was left behind. I was very, very concerned. I stressed that psychologically, I'm seeing my daughter deteriorate physically. She's not functioning. I never wanted to ever say I was worried about suicide, but I can tell you during that time, I had very, very big concerns. We recently went to the VA, and Mallory has had MRI after MRI after MRI. I've seen firsthand how these men and women are being treated. They go in thinking, okay, well, I serve, I'm gonna get education, I'm gonna have health care, I'm gonna have benefits. They come back and it doesn't exist. This road has been extremely long and frustrating between you know, my initial accident and having doctors basically tell me I was crazy, that it was in my head, and um, that nothing was wrong with me, or try this, or you're just not trying, or here's some more pills, just take all these pills. Good luck getting, you know, starting all over with the VA. And I'm like, I just spent nine years trying to figure out what's wrong with me, and now I gotta start all over again. So that's what it's been. It's been more injections, more imaging. The conditions of the VA um, are deplorable from, from a nursing perspective. Uh, the very first time I walked into that entity, um, honestly, I was disgusted. As a healthcare provider and as a mother, I was outraged. I've been called uh, a faker. I've been called a drug seeker. Uh, I've been told that they just needed to up my anti-anxiety medication and I had the um, doctor that was doing my evaluation tell me I was fat and that's why I had joint problems. And the neurologist said to her, I don't deal with pain. In all my years in healthcare, I have never heard of any medical professional say they don't deal with pain. At that point, I knew <laughs> we weren't gonna get anywhere in the VA. So on the way home, I said, I'm going to call Ketamine Wellness Center and I'm gonna ask. I said, this is a last ditch effort. I gotta do something, because I'm losing my daughter. And uh, he said to me that, um, he goes, I think we can help. You know, it's hard. There's a lot, of, a lot to go through. Um, so Mallory and I talked about it. And I said, you know, let's go for it. Today is my first day of ketamine infusions. And I am excited and nervous. And honestly, it's just a, a ball of emotions and a, a lot of hope. We know it's not a cure, but if she can be free of pain for a while um, and depression, um, even if it's a week, it's better than living it every day because I can't imagine what it's like to be in pain um, every single day. Mallory is the perfect candidate for ketamine for multiple reasons. She's got post-traumatic stress. She's got depression related to some of the situations she experienced in the military. And she's got CRPS up in her right hip. And it's been fairly recently diagnosed. It hasn't been something that has been outstanding for a long time. She is passionate about getting better. And it's evident by the fact that she independently was able to get herself off of all the opiates that she was prescribed by the system prior to initiating the ketamine infusions. Mallory stated that her pain level consistently runs between a seven and an eight. We're hoping that we can, after first treatment, get her scores down to maybe half or two thirds of where she's currently at. 
and if she's doing well with the infusions and tolerates the treatments, then we can increase the dosages and continue to try to get prolonged results. I'm here for my third ketamine infusion and I'm super excited. After my first treatment, I slept like a rock for the first time in a long time and I actually fell asleep easily and I didn't wake up through the night. Uh, that <laughs> hasn't happened in years. And right now I'm at a three, maybe a four on my pain scale and I haven't been that low in an extremely long time. And I'm super excited and super hopeful for this third treatment and, and I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to feel good again. I've also had a lot of mental clarity. I don't feel as scatterbrained anymore and it, that feels amazing to me. And I'm not stumbling all over my words and I know what I want to say and I feel great. I feel great. After her first couple of treatments, we are truly seeing a remarkable response. We started treating her just two days ago, and today she's doing things that she never dreamed she would be doing again, just in terms of basic interactions with her family, her pet. She's tolerating the treatments beautifully. We're hoping that by the time she finishes the first three infusions, that her pain score will maybe be either a zero by the day, a few days post the infusions, or at least down to two to three, and she'll get some prolonged benefit. And then if she's doing well, then within a couple weeks, we'll have her back, do another two infusions back to back, and then again, it'll be really based on how she continues to live her life. It's been about two weeks since my first infusion. And um, yesterday I had my second treatment of the second run and um, I'm feeling really good. I went into the initial treatment um, two weeks ago and I was about at a 7-8 uh, at my best. I left that treatment at a 2 and it, it grew back to maybe a 5 or 6, um, but now I'm at a 1. So I feel pretty freaking amazing. I haven't been out of one in 10 plus years, so I, I can't begin to, to fathom just this feeling I have. It's, it's amazing. It's such a good feeling. I'm not at a zero, which I'm, I'm good with, but a one has completely changed my life. I'm on the Air Force Wounded Warrior team, and I will be competing at the Wounded Warrior Games next month. I'm on the air rifle team, I'm on the swim team, and I'm, I'm doing a wheelchair track bike. My goals of working out here go actually beyond the Warrior Games. I'm definitely hoping that I can stay focused and stay training and get, get as healthy as I can be, because that's gonna be the, the goal of maintaining uh, myself through this disease I have. You're talking about the patients who are often without hope, with desperation in their hearts. And we have turned lives around. We're seeing miracles in these patients. And I cannot tell you how motivating that is. We go into healthcare to help people. And the best part is when you do find people like Mallory, and we've got hundreds of stories of these people who've gone through the system, and they haven't been able to find something that really gives them the relief they're looking for. We've seen it time and time again where patients' lives have been changed and turned around, and they're back living with their, with their children and, and playing in the park with their kids and, and not just huddled up underneath blankets in a, in a dark bedroom, you know, hiding from society. They're back actively working and, and, and taking care of their lives. I feel like I'm me again for so long. I was trapping myself a prisoner in my own mind and a prisoner in my own house and uh, literally became a recluse. I'm glad I'm, I'm out there and I'm smiling. I feel so good that I'm actually smiling.